Hey, good morning. My name is uh, Randy McIntyre, and as was mentioned earlier, I'm the director for the Air Missile Defense Cross-Functional Team, which is the number five priority in the Army modernization priority. So we're going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about uh, what we're doing, how we started off as a pilot program uh, a year ago uh, from this conference when it was initiated, uh, some of our progress, and then really what we're doing as we've moved out of pilot stage and, uh, and part of the new Army Futures Command with respect to uh, what we're working on next. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our approach to uh, multi-domain operations. So we get asked, hey, what's the air defense strategy and what are you, exactly are you working on? And I've had several folks say, hey, if you take the Tippy 2 radar that can see forever and you couple it with uh, uh, the Death Star laser, that should be all that we need as we move into the future. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the different threat sets that are conveyed on that slide in the red, the red uh, ovals, uh, and maybe some of the different tools that you need for the different threats. And some of them that will be more cost effective as we move into the 21st century. But kind of starting in the upper left uh, on that slide, you see the ballistic missile threat. Well, Today, we got the, the, the greatest Patriot Force uh, and tactical ballistic missile force on the planet. Nobody can do it better than, than our Patriot soldiers today. So I would just tell you to our adversaries and everybody else, rest assured that we've got that mission set covered. We know how to do it. We've been doing it since Desert Storm, uh, and we continue to get better and better as we, as we work in that, that space with ballistic missile defense. As you, as you come down from the strategic level and you start moving into the operational level, uh, we are working to uh, improve our stance that, in that area so we're relevant in the 21st century. Uh, and that's at, to get after cruise missile defense. So we're working on our indirect fire protection capability uh, and coming up with solutions uh, that will defeat uh, cruise missiles. And I would tell you today, Patriot can defeat cruise missiles. So it's not the fact that we are naked by any stretch of the imagination. It's the fact that we're trying to figure out how to do it more cost effectively as we move into the future. One of the things you see, the green boxes uh, between Patriot and uh, MSHORAD, which we'll spend a lot of time in the MSHORAD as we get towards the tactical edge of the, the battlefield as I'm moving across the, the spectrum, is that we really see multi-mission battalions uh, being in our future. And that's, that's uh, as we build capability at the tactical edge with our, our mobile short-range air defense, and that's, that's a system that we're going to have on a striker that's going to be able to keep up with the maneuver force. Uh, we see the indirect fire protection capability being in that formation as well as, as towards the high mad high to medium air defense formations with, with Patriots. So that's going to be the glue uh, that, that bonds the, the branch together. Is, so we don't want to go back to the uh, future where we had a bifurcated force that was both HIMAD and SHORAD, we want to have air missile defenders working in formations uh, that, can, that can span that spectrum. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, on, on some of our uh, good news stories that from a CFT perspective, uh, we, we, we worked hard on figuring out what did the maneuver force need in this formation so we could get after multi-domain operations, reduce the risk to the maneuver force, and be able to break up that A2, AD bubble with respect to what are we doing uh, in the different domains uh, when they become contested. And so we, we believe that you will break up uh, uh, the freedom to maneuver through fires and maneuver. And so we thought it was very important as we move into the 21st century that we got a capability down in the maneuver force uh, that can protect them from air, the variety of air threats that can be presented to them. So we are shoring up that part of the, uh, the operation with uh, mobile short-range air defense. So we did a demonstration, and I know General Rash is going to talk a little bit uh, later from his perspective on how we got to where we are today. But I, I would just tell you that we've, uh, we have moved out uh, in this area, uh, and uh, we are working towards our goal of having four battalions of uh, mobile short-range air defense by 
fiscal year 22, uh, and we're on track. So we are we are literally moving pretty fast with respect to uh, how we're acquiring these systems. So as we as we build the the future force, we've had uh, what we call the air defense principles for many many years, since the branch started out in 1968. Uh, 50 years, so we we're celebrating our 50th anniversary as a branch uh, this year. But mass, mix, mobility, integration have always been our principles, and what we're finding, they are tried and true today as we move forward. We, we need to be able to have a tiered and layered approach to the different threats. From the low, small uh, UASs that we'll see uh, from the drones to the rotary wing and the fixed wing, uh, to cruise missiles, to tactical missiles, tactical ballistic missiles, to intercontinental ballistic missiles. So there's not one tool that does all that. Um, what you'll find is you need to have a variety of tools and where you can get some twofers, for example, that can kind of span a couple different threat sets there. Uh, that's, that's, that's the areas that we are really focusing on that can do that. But you're not going to find a system that's cost effective that will deal with a drone uh, and have to deal with a, a tactical ballistic missile. That's, that's not where we want to be. So what we're proposing as we move forward is that we're going to have a mixture of gun and missiles, and then we're moving towards directed energy very heavily uh, into the future. So we expect to have formations uh, in the, in the, in the near, within, the ne within the next five years to the, certainly within the decade. Uh, what you'll see is we'll transition, and I always use one-thirds, two-thirds as a rule. Uh, what we'll start off is we'll, we'll have a gun missile mix as, as we do today and then we'll start to uh, cut in the technology of directed energy and we'll have two-thirds gun missile mix and one-third directed energy and as that technology matures over time and gets better uh, we will find ourselves with a two-thirds directed energy uh, mix and about a one-third uh, kinetic kill with uh, effectors with the gun missiles. So that's kind of how we're, how we're shaping our strategy and how we're moving forward and uh, to work towards getting the cost per intercept down as well. Uh, I'd like to go to the, my next slide. Next slide, please. As they're, as they're doing that, this is a, a description of how we see the, the battlefield kind of flowing there and, and it gets back to those multi-mission battalions that we got in the upper left. You got one that it's got a Patriot formation there present day and then what will be additive, uh, what we hope for, it will be a, a, a cruise missile defense capability that will be supplementary. And, and I would tell you directed energy is complementary through all this as we, as we go forward. And then down in the tactical edge in our M. Shorad battalions, they'll find themselves in our divisions the goal is to have one of those per, per, per division, both compost one and two, so that's active duty and National Guard. Uh, and that formation uh, will have uh, our MSHOR right on a striker vehicle that will have a gun missile mix. Uh, and then as we get direct energy, you'll, they'll have, it, that'll be in there as well. But we started to take a look at the kind of ops of how we're going to fight and how are we going to address this prevalent unmanned aerial system threats that are, that are out there. And I think most of you saw the opening ceremony to the Olympics and they had the, uh, the, the snowboarder there and then turned into the Olympic rinks. Uh, my family was going ooh and ah like a uh, uh, watching fireworks and I was sitting there going oh, expletive. Um, and what, that, what that really meant, meant, meant to me in, in, uh, in my job. But we take it very seriously uh, of where that's going. So uh, as we looked at the way the Army is going to fight in multi-domain operations, and uh, we realized in the brigade combat team there's about 175 different platforms uh, that you can't have air defense everywhere. And so that, that brigade combat team is going to have to get into this fight as well. And so we were working on technologies that, that would be platform agnostic uh, with respect to having an omnipresence of air defense as we move, move forward. Uh, so we focused on uh, the bigger threats that they can't handle. And, and so this is our attempt to take a look at the different threats from rocket artillery and mortars, uh, the various sizes of UASs that are out there, classes one through five, the low, slow, small, to the, to the bigger ones, uh, to cruise missiles, to 
uh, tactical ballistic missiles. And who's going to have primary responsibility and who's going to have secondary? It's just a, it gives us a guide as, as we move forward and we're trying to develop capability uh, that we need. Uh, and then you see how we're, we're layered in a tiered approach from uh, the front edge of the battle and the uh, close area support as we work back to the operational support area. So I think I've talked enough to, to put the, the soccer ball in play. I threw it in with two hands and both feet on the ground. And I'm going to pass it over to my teammate, uh, Brigadier General Rob Rash, who's the, the program executive officer for uh, missiles in space, and let Rob t tell his story. Thanks, Rob. Next chart. Next chart, please. So, so good morning. My name is Rob Rash. I'm the PEO for Missiles in Space. And when we started this effort, actually, General McIntyre and I were the same height. Um, it's it's had, a, had, a, had a dampening effect on me uh, over the last year or so. So, so truth be told, um, if you were going to do kind of a case analysis of, of how do the cross-functional teams and our PEO PMs work together, this would be a, a, a great case study. Uh, truth be told, the effort actually initiated before uh, AOSA last year, uh, the thought of it, um, when we were given as a PEO, given direction in, in March of, uh, of 2017 to execute, uh, execute a demonstration of SHORAD capabilities, realizing uh, that we, wanted, we hadn't fielded new SHORAD uh, capacity or capabilities in a while. Let's see what the, the state of the art is. So we were given that task, and so we put our team to, to, to work uh, to bring in industry the good ideas. And in about seven, eight months, uh, with the help of industry, a lot of help from industry, we were out at the range. Uh, that was October 2017, uh, a year ago, uh, a year ago from now. The results of that, uh, of that effort, along with a lot of other efforts, uh, we also do the counter UAS uh, support for the soldiers in theater now, so we're learning a lot in those areas as well. Uh, we put a report together and fed that to this newly formed cross-functional team uh, that was announced this time last year. And, and they took that, uh, took, took that work and ran with it, and in a matter of weeks, uh, not, not months, not years, but weeks, uh, we're able to, to generate a directed requirement, get it signed, get it back to us on the material acquisition side, where we handed it off to our Cruise Missile Defense Systems Project Office. They had an announcement out to industry within a month, uh, a down select within about two months, and just awarded the contract for what you see on the far left for this initial uh, MSHORAD capability. Uh, so a, a, a record time, I believe, when you look at... Uh, at how we do business, business typically uh, in acquisition, and hopefully a, a good case study on how we can do things, things moving forward in this area. Uh, the key part for that was the communications between the user and the material developer and industry. The communication with industry was critical uh, throughout this entire process to make sure that we did not generate requirements that were not technically uh, technically achievable in the timeline that the director requirement laid out for us, which was to have an initial operational capability in FY20, two battalions of uh, MSHORAD uh, capacity by 21, and two more battalions by 22. So this initial SHORAD platform you see here on the left is a, strikel, a striker uh, based uh, based capability. Um, it's using uh, one of our uh, currently existing command and control systems called FADC2 as the C2 for the, uh, for the uh, air missile defense package. And then the key is what we're actually putting on this striker. So the striker is just the, the platform to carry it into the, into the battle space, but this reconfigure, reconfigurable integrated weapons platform, the RIP turret, uh, which has been demonstrated on a, on a lot of other systems, uh, a lot of other platforms in the Army's inventory, was key because it allowed us to, to tailor the mission equipment package that we wanted for this particular capability. Uh, so for this first version, this initial MSHORAD capability, it's got Stinger, uh, a Stinger pod, four Stinger pod built on. It's got two Hellfire uh, that we actually demonstrated uh, with industry's help out at the, uh, out at the demonstration uh, a year ago uh, that we can do a ground to air uh, for, for, with Hellfire. Uh, it's got a 30 millimeter cannon. Um, which c currently is, is also already been integrated on Striker, but we're really looking in this case for something coming out this next year was a 30 millimeter airburst round uh, to go with that with that cannon uh, to provide a, a cheaper cost uh, cost uh, uh, to intercept uh, and a 7.62. Uh, in addition to the 30 millimeter cannon, also uh, this year we're cutting in a prox proximity fuse into the Stinger weapon system. 
Uh, that should roll in here early, uh, early this next calendar year. So as we run those stingers through shelf life extension, uh, they come off the line all modernized with this proximity, uh, proximity fuse, which gives us a new capability against some of the uh, UAS threats. Now, as we move forward, so as I talk to you, talk you through the timeline, uh, 20 initial capability, two battalions by 21, the second two battalions by 22. Uh, what that does is that allows the user to then uh, look at the state of, of the TTPs, the doctrine, and help inform the next set of requirements for the objective MSHORAD program. So after we field the, the four battalions, we'll get an updated requirements document back from the user, which will feed that, that next effort. Between now and then, uh, we're looking at some things uh, here in this middle column, some of the enhanced, uh, an enhanced MSHORAD interceptor, uh, realizing we'd like to get longer legs, uh, longer than what we have with Hellfire and Stinger. Uh, some electronic warfare capabilities that we're currently rolling out with our, uh, with our counter UAS efforts, uh, get those integrated on the platform as well. And then, uh, of course, as the Army moves to Integrated Air Missile Defense Battle Command System, IBCS, FADC2 will converge into that, uh, into that platform. So it'll be IBCS-based, which is going to really increase the situational awareness uh, of, those, of that crew that's, uh, that's manning this platform. And, and all of that will lead to what we're looking at longer term, which is uh, the introduction of directed energy. Uh, a lot of interest, obviously, by senior leaders on, on injecting this capability, and we're working hand-in-hand -hand with our uh, space missile defense counterparts who are kind of leading the SAT efforts for that. And I'm going to turn it over here in just a second to, uh, to Dr. Robin Craig to talk you through that. But as we've worked with them and found the cutoff time for integrating technology at the right TRL level, TRL level 6 and 22, uh, and also looking at it from a manufacturing readiness level to make sure that actually as we pull that into a program of record, it can still meet the timelines for the user that's requiring a lot of uh, synchronization across, uh, across from the S&T to, uh, to the acquisition PMPEO side, and again, always communicating back to the user. So, uh, so we, we've certainly appreciated the, the great communications uh, with the user on this and with industry as well as we provide this capability out in record time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Robin, who's going to talk you through uh, some of the directed energy. Thank you, sir. Uh, next chart. So my name is Craig Robin. I'm the Army Senior Research Scientist for Directed Energy Applications. Um, high energy laser falls into that uh, technology category. Uh, you know, along the lines of what uh, General Rash just uh, discussed, we're going to talk about our multi-mission high energy laser effort, which uh, is a technology maturation. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh. One inch away. Got it. <laughs> so uh, multi-mission high energy laser is a technology maturation initi initiative, which in the Army is a program um, designed to take key S&T technologies and um, enhance their ability for transition uh, to acquisition programs. Obviously, high-energy laser fits into that, uh, that, that category. Um, we are putting a 50-kilowatt laser on a striker. Uh, the plan is to have a TRL-7 TRL demonstration in FY21. Uh, um, concurrent with that, we have a surrogate high-energy laser system that we call MEHEL, Mobile Expeditionary High-Energy Laser, and that effort was started in 2016 uh, with a 2-kilowatt uh, surrogate energy laser integrated onto a striker and demonstrated at Infix. Um, so, so the the power level there is is low and it demonstrates counter you know near short range counter UAS capability. But the real goal of that effort is to um, uh, get the get the technology in the soldiers' hands and demonstrate uh, develop TTPs and concept of operations. Uh, we've carried that experimentation campaign forward with a kind of a test experiment, test experiment, um, uh, or test fix test kind of uh, 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 methodology. And so we upgraded from a, a two kilowatt in 2016 to a five kilowatt in 2017. And uh, this year at um, MFIX we'll have a 10 kilowatt demonstration uh, uh, with a, a laser technology that is uh, representative of uh, what we plan to put in the 50 kilowatt um, and 100 kilowatt health TVD system. And with that, I think we can open up for questions. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, great. So uh, we want to give uh, plenty of time for, for Q&A, and that's uh, our presentation. But uh, at this point in time, we open up the audience for questions. I think we got a gentleman back in the back corner. 
Uh, this is for the dock. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of talk about the 50 kilowatt as opposed to the 100 kilowatt going on certain types of vehicles. Uh, just like to know, could you explain the rationale uh, with that thought? Uh, yes, sir. So, um, uh, so we, we have two kind of concurrent efforts: an S&T effort uh, to put 100 kilowatt on an FMTV and the 50 kilowatt on on a striker. Um, the 100 kilowatts addressing the if pick requirement. Um, so, so to take a step back, the way that we develop uh, uh, capability concepts, you know, starts with lethality. So, with if pick, we have a threat set. Uh, we do static. Uh, uh, static lethality testing to understand what kind of energy it takes to, to defeat threats. Um, and then we have modeling and simulation tools and run specific scenarios to understand what kind of capability we would have. So 100 kilowatt was not a directed power level. It's a notional power level that, that um, the primes that responded to our S&T, uh, our, our, our uh, um, RFP, uh, came with as meeting the scenario uh, that was provided to them to meet the you know to, to meet the IFPIC requirement. Uh, the 50 kilowatt for M Shored at the time that that power level was uh, at the time that that power level was conceived, uh, the 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 director requirement didn't exist, and our thought process there was 50 kilowatts is the uh, lowest power level of military utility that we could get onto uh, a small combat vehicle like a striker. I think we got a question over here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tom Smith, for, former uh, Shorad guy. What are, the, what are the challenges you see for, um, for uh, force structure and training in, in uh, the branch? Okay, uh, great, great question, Tom. So the, previous to being the uh, director for cross-functional team, I was the, the commandant for air defense, so I was certainly looking at things from entire dot mill PF perspective. And uh, what you'll find today is that we've got somewhat of a generational gap um, of our short-range air defense expertise that are cer cer certainly in uniform today. Uh, but there's, there's, I've had a lot of patriots that, that are ready to get into the game and, and come help us with that. But it is going to be different in the way we fight. Uh, so in, in terms of force structure, um, we've competed fairly well over the last two TAA processes, the total army analysis process. And, and uh, we're starting, we, so our, our uh, equipping strategy is lining up with the force structure, uh, certainly for these first four battalions. And uh, we'll see where that's at. But there's some analysis that we need to do uh, to meet the, the chief's goal of one per division. Uh, we think there's the resources out there, certainly within the Compo 2 area, they're, they are much closer to maybe achieving that than we are on the active duty side, uh, but we'll continue to do that. But I think we're off to uh, a pretty good start with respect to trying to tie in the doctrine and the training. I would tell you that the, the Fire Center of Excellence has been leaning forward heavily as we started drafting the directed requirement, they're looking at the facilities and the training base and what it's going to take to, to be able to do the, uh, train the load as we go forward. As we first, our first battalion, quite frankly, just stood up in Germany, uh, 5-4-ADA, uh, and we equipped it with Avengers in lieu of uh, receiving this capability. So we got, a, we got our first unit out there. Uh, and they are ready to receive this capability uh, uh, when it becomes available. And we'll do, we'll do new equipment training and, uh, and, and uh, new equipment fielding directly to that unit. Hopefully that answers your question. Good morning, excellent talk. Um, I'm, I'm curious how these cross-functional teams are coordinating with each other. You guys have a no doubt a, a huge set of challenges with the aggressive timelines, but as you are experimenting and prototyping, how are you interfacing with the other cross-functional teams? Because you mentioned integrating these capabilities onto various platforms, but as those platforms change and they're going through iterative experimentation cycles, how are you coordinating with the various CFTs through development? Okay, that's a good question. I'll, I'll kind of start off and I think I'll, I'll turn this over to, to my teammate, Rock, uh, General Rasher, in a minute. 
but with the, uh, the cross-functional teams, there was no doubt as we started off, we were all focused on our own little area, just trying to get started. But what, what, what has happened uh, and started several months ago was a horizontal integration between the cross-functional teams. And uh, we're in weekly meetings and we're understanding what each one of us are, are, are doing. And we, we're, we got folks going into each one of our meetings and trying to understand. Particularly in our case, network is a big deal. So we are, we are working hard with network. Long range precision fires, for example, my, my teammate, uh, Colonel Promotable, uh, John Rafferty, we, we work in the same building. So between long range precision fires and air missile defense, uh, you see some synergy right there because we are literally down the hall from each other. Uh, but to your point, there's a lot of work to do as we do that. Now the next generation combat vehicle, as they work that, we're keeping our eye on that. We are, we are pushing directed energy that we think will um, be able to be a, a capability that they can use. So they're, they're keeping an eye on our efforts there. Uh, we, we like the reconfigurable uh, turret that we chose uh, for us, and we think maybe that could be a part of an answer on that next generation combat vehicle platform. So we're trying to work smart and not hard in a generation. I thought you nailed it pretty well, Randy. The, the one thing I would add is uh, open systems architecture from a, from a material solution perspective gives us a lot of flexibility in what we do, uh, not just with, with taking this turret, potentially placing it on next generation combat vehicle, but also uh, ensuring that we can add the extra equipment, uh, those other uh, air defense you know, short range capabilities and who knows what the future brings. Industry uh, industry is working hard on those, but making sure that we have uh, an interface control document specification that we can have them build to uh, to allow us to meet those. But, but, but the point that General McIntyre made about communication, it is really about communication. Uh, and I think we've seen a, a lot of positive communication as we've, we've worked through this effort. Yeah, and I, I just put an exclamation point on it. Lieutenant General Richardson's making sure that we're talking to each other as well. So. When we're not, we get reminded too. <laughs> so, any other questions from, from the audience? If not, we'll give you back some time. Okay, with that said, uh, do you guys have any closing comments? Uh, start with Dr. Rob. Thanks. Okay. Hey, thanks, thanks for your attention. Uh, we enjoyed it. I would tell you we're very excited about what we're doing uh, within this portfolio, and uh, we, we are building capability that will move us into the 21st century. And uh, we, we w welcome industry's input, and we look forward to, to working with all the great ideas that are out there. Thanks.